Welcome to this special edition of All in the Field. Today, we're going to be talking with our friends from the Morningstar Company. We'll be talking about integrated supply chains, everything from the planting, the processing, and the delivery on a worldwide distribution network. It's really pretty amazing how connected agriculture is and the high-tech ways in which food is brought to our plate. All of these insights and more on this special edition of All in the Field. AWS in Agriculture. Hi, I'm Dr. Karen Hildebrand, and I'm joined here today by John Marciniak, our Senior Solutions Architect out of Chicago. And John works with our agricultural customers based in the Midwest. And I understand that while we're talking about tomatoes with our customers today, that there's something I should know about tomatoes in Chicago. That's right, Karen. And being from Chicago, uh, you know, I love myself a Chicago-style hot dog. And oddly enough, tomatoes are sort of a hot topic in Chicago. Fun fact, Karen. You won't find ketchup on a Chicago-style hot dog, but tomato wedges are actually a welcome delight. Really? And Karen, I know you've wedged yourself <laughs> as a oh, passionate fourth-generation farmer and the head of solution architecture for our worldwide agriculture industry here at AWS. But oddly enough, I don't know your favorite food. Oh, that's a really hard one. I can't like narrow that down because our agricultural customers grow all of our food. <laughs> I would say I make a really great mean mushroom soup mm. and I really like the texture of tempeh, but I will eat anything once. And I know I just opened myself up, so whatever somebody's gonna say that they want me to try, I now just said I'd do it once, but I will qualify that. I wanna know how it was either grown or made. Nice. Mushroom soup sounds delicious. I might actually have to have you cook me some because uh, if not, I might throw a tempeh tantrum. Oh, but with that so said, <laughs> what is all in the basket, Karen? This isn't a quiz show. I love all of your jokes, but this is actually a main ingredient for our customers that they grow on all in the field would be our actual show name. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but with that, let's talk about the solutions that are important to our customer as they're working with their primary ingredient and their work with AWS. So with that, let's talk about uh, having our special guest on, Aaron Jim Petro. Hi, hi Karen, hi John. Nice Welcome, to meet you. have a seat. Thank you. So Aaron, thanks so much for coming. Let's start off by just getting a 60 second overview of the Morningstar company. Yeah. The Morningstar Packing Company was founded in 1970 by a truck driver. He was driving up and down the state, realizing that the conditions were changing. The interstate was going in, the aqueduct was now driving down the Central Valley, and we can now grow and process tomatoes in the Central Valley instead of the Bay Area. And then technology was changing, so instead of putting all the tomatoes up in a can, we can now put them up in bulk format. So it allowed us to kind of craft this new ingredients market which we've since grown to become the world's largest with our three factories here in California. We process from July to October. We've got about 600 full-time colleagues, about 2,500 seasonal colleagues annually, and close to about a billion dollars a year in annual sales. So we're not a branded company. You won't see us on the shelf, but we are behind all the big brands, be it ketchup or pasta sauce or pizza sauce. Just seeing those there was making me hungry, so I had to set them <laughs> off to the side for now. <laughs> but we've talked a lot about being a peculiar company at AWS and the culture of innovation that has helped us to work backwards from our customers. But we also know that in working with the Morningstar company, you have a really unique culture yourselves, and you've really thought about that at innovation in very different ways. And so I know for those of us who went to business school that we had to probably read your Harvard Business Review article around how your company is structured. Uh, so I'm curious, what does your role look like at the Morningstar Company and what has your journey been like there? So mission-focused management goes back to those days as a truck driver where you don't have a manager sitting in the passenger seat next to you. You, you know what you have to do and you deliver uh, to your destination and you, you make a quick turnaround. You add value to the supply chain. Uh, so same concept with a bigger business now. And uh, my mission is to produce terrific tomato paste at zero cost while maintaining perfect customer satisfaction. And within that- That sounds that, like a great mission. Uh, big, big mission, but a fun one. I have my KPIs, my stepping stones that help me figure out what am I doing. It's my dashboard. And uh, along the way, I have to make commitments. I have to make agreements with different colleagues to help get that mission accomplished. And then they in turn expect something from me. So the uh, leadership is very situational. Uh, it's based on competency and integrity, but it's meant to help you problem solve quickly, be on your feet and adapt to changing conditions because things are always gonna change, conflicts are always gonna arise. 
and we can't rely on hierarchy to solve the problems for us. So we implement this mission-focused management and it just is meant to get things done. That's really cool. And I think the, the interesting thing is we've continued to work with you and, and as we're starting along that journey, really, there's so many areas as a vertically integrated supply chain that you touch that have to do with agriculture and that many of our other customers are solving for as well. Whether that be understanding which varieties you're going to be selecting, understanding you know the growing conditions inside your greenhouses as those plants get started, or you know how do you actually transplant them, when's the right time, the growing degree units. So many pieces of data are calculated and captured along the entire kind of life cycle of the tomato before it even reaches your factory. Can you tell us a little bit how you think about the amount of data that you are capturing and, and how that goes into the overall processes that you're uh, solving for? Yeah, but this, this much uh, vertical integration, it's at times it feels more like we're generating information than capturing it. It, it could be a lot to take in, but you're really trying to craft this plan that ultimately maximizes uh, the yield per acre and do so in a way that meets the disease uh, resilience uh, issues that might be in the field. So you have adaptability, you have timing, so will it meet our factory processing schedule? And then you have different genetics. So will this make the correct ketchup type paste or should it be used more for export market for uh, a thinner viscosity for juice? So this whole thing uh, typically uh, moves pretty slowly because it's pretty big. And the earlier in the supply chain that you can make the right decisions, the bigger the impact is all the way to the customer. We try to maintain the in view that at the end of the day, it's about that $5 pizza that feeds a family or the, the $2 or $3 pasta sauce on the shelf that's really meant to provide you know, a wholesome type food that can feed people on a budget and remain, maintain your pantry staple uh, in, in your household. Uh, so at times this, this thing is, is a bit complex and challenging and that's where I think we're trying to figure out can we get some new insights? Can we get some new visibility that helps us maximize all these different things? That's really interesting. And with that insight and the, and the visibility, you know, as we move into the growing season, you know, there's a lot of insights, I'm sure, in, in growing and production. Things like knowing uh, what to plant and, and where and, and how to irrigate and, and much, much more. So as you worked with uh, AWS and understanding the factory, how important is it to also understand the field? It's even more important in the field. Um, so the factories get all the attention because they're these big stainless steel towers, you know, and, and, and pumps and there's steam and there's heat and there's people. But really a tomato plant in the ground, not just the factory, but the tomato plant in the ground is a factory in itself. Uh, it works in the daytime, it rests at night, and it has to be efficient at converting water, inputs, uh, light, uh, carbon dioxide. This whole thing has to be maximized to generate the most tomatoes per, per factory for a little plant. And in that sense, we have over half a billion factories out in the field. Trying to figure out how to really maximize those key attributes. It's fun, it's challenging, but that's what we really like. And to the degree that we could add value throughout the whole supply chain by maximizing the field yield, doing more with less, it really excites both us and our growers that we contract with because it really helps us move and make changes in the industry. We have to export tomato products, which means we have to be competitive on a global scale as well. So it's not just about the domestic market, but internationally competing with other export markets. And using data, that's what we're good at, what we want to be better at, can really help us leverage this, uh, this thing better. And that's truly fascinating because you think about all of that data that's being pulled together in order to understand early, before it's even in the ground, what's happening when it's in the ground, understanding the commodity markets globally. Then, you know, even the small logistics pieces, which are not small, uh, having to actually haul all of that to your factories. It's really fascinating to think of all the complexity there. I, I feel like I want to solve all these problems. But as we talk about those, you know, you really got started with AWS ProServe team in the factory and thinking about how you would collect that data differently to provide new insights and, or different insights that you've been able to, to produce before. And so I'm a little bit curious, how did you get started on that process? How did you overcome any of the barriers that, that may have pre-existed that? It comes to um, you know, market leadership. It really it means going into dark rooms and turning lights on where things seem scary and, and having enough courage to do so. Having a good partner by your side makes all the difference. Now let's dive a little bit more deeply into the AWS services and solutions that can make it possible to connect your processing plant to the AWS cloud. 
As Aaron mentioned, obtaining an air gap is typically something customers have as a blocker or a barrier to moving data to the cloud. Now, Morningstar Company was able to overcome that blocker by using AWS partner network technology partner Owl Cybersecurity's data diode. The data diode enables customers to achieve the ability to move data in one direction only. That data can move out of the factory floor, but there is no way in which data can move back to the OT network. By being able to overcome that challenge by using the data diode, customers are able to then move their data to the AWS cloud using one of three typical architecture patterns. Typically, we'll see customers have selected to use OPC UA and connect to AWS IoT site-wise. Other customers will select MQTT and they will select AWS IoT Core or using MQTT to AWS Greengrass to AWS IoT Core. Now those three common connection patterns are part of the industrial machine connectivity solution, which enables customers to quickly prototype or proof of concept the connectivity patterns of their plant or processing facility to the AWS cloud. The deployable cloud formation template takes about 10 minutes to spin up but certainly go out and check it out in order to quickly and rapidly evaluate how you can connect your facility to the cloud. The services that underlie that solution are Amazon S3, which is a typical data lake strategy, enabling customers to move all of that data in and then choose the right purpose-built database based on the solutions that they're trying to build. Typically, we'll see customers use Amazon Redshift to structure their data. And for those customers that are comfortable using SQL as their querying engine, we'll typically see Amazon Athena. Now for customers who like to ensure that they have the ability to create a catalog and a metadata repository, AWS Glue is used in that architecture. There's an automated crawler within Glue, as well as a data cataloging engine that enables us to include things like data lineage. Customers that are wanting to create the value in predictive and preventative maintenance will typically be using Amazon SageMaker to build those AI and ML models rapidly and understand how they can gain value seeing that digital twin of their factory floor. In order to deploy that, we often see the need for business intelligence and visualization in order to tell the story of what's happening within the facility. And we'll see customers select either Amazon QuickSight or more recently, Amazon Managed Grafina in order to tell that story and make it real as to what the action is that's being recommended. In order to bring the entire solution together, we use AWS Lambda. And because security is job zero at AWS, you'll see services that are common within all of our architectures like AWS KMS, AWS IAM, Identity and Access Management, CloudWatch and CloudTrail, which can be configured in order to ensure that you have auditing as well as events and rules that can alert and trigger. And with that, let's jump back into the conversation with Aaron. You talked a little bit about factories and the data coming out of it and, and, you know, working with some of the mechanical processes in the factories to get some of that data out. What, what kind of uh, areas around sustainability and the use of gravity and, and, and flumes of water and those kind of processes uh, have We have love gravity. With? Yeah. It's, fr <laughs> it's, it's free. It's not taxable that we know of, and it never breaks down, and it doesn't take any horsepower. Uh, so anytime we design in the factories, we look for gravity, we look for natural evaporative cooling. We look for ways to do more with less. And it is sustainable, but sustainability goes to that really core business practice of making good profit. Things that can last and be competitive and actually add true value to the operation. So anytime you can combine resources, you can burn natural gas to make electricity, but then you could take that exhaust and now make steam. You've now taken one input and turn it into two outputs. And that's been really what we've driven a lot of our capital projects and our expansion off of. In addition to that, economy of scale and trying to do more without really adding to the overhead. So sustainability has always been at our core premise because if you can't harness sustainable practices, you're, you're out of business. Absolutely. And I think that's what's really exciting about being able to actually see your factories working is the integrated loops that you've created, the way that you've been extremely innovative in mechanical solutions and digital solutions. It helps us to think differently too. So we'd love to have an idea today of kind of what are the things that you're most excited about uh, continuing to work with AWS on? What are the things that are problems that you're looking to solve 
evolve or the culture of innovation that you're looking to instill? Yeah, so we, we, we dabbled a little bit with some geospatial imagery uh, as it relates to water management and kind of managing tomato stress. But that's always been an operational project more than it is a strategic initiative. And so a strategic initiative of using that geospatial imaging now would be, where do we go in the state? Who do we contract with? What are they growing currently with how much water? How well are they doing it? And then why aren't they growing tomatoes? We know our crop can compete. We know it's valuable. And we know people love tomato products. So using geospatial imagery with some advanced analytics or insights could really help us shape and craft through the state because we can contract where the water is and where the land is and where the tomatoes can really do a good job. We're still going to continue on in our factory setting. Um, that's a, a lot of moving parts there and there's a lot of uh, initiatives we can continue to build on our, our, our starting point. But uh, really trying to find this way of tying it all together for the business. And that's what's been exciting also about working with the AWS team is introducing some also business strategy. It's not just about the technology, but it's about the whole business. We've had folks come in and just talk to us about one project or one thing, and not about how we can kind of really see our business differently. And that's where things like data management becomes even more important, and, and having a known source of truth becomes even more important. So apart from all the technical rollouts, we're really happy that we're starting to get more insights on business as it relates to data and making that transformation along the way. So Aaron, we have a whole bunch of technologists watching us right now. What is one thing that you would say uh, to a technologist that's getting started with ag or is interested in agriculture or you know, driving solutions to help feed the world? Really have to keep it simple. I think that's a general concept, but it has to be simple enough where it's reliable, it can be adopted easily, and it's versatile. It can go throughout different conditions, uh, and it can be understood pretty easily. I think the, the simplicity is important. And really, it's about playing the game. I mean, we want to play the game. That's what we're all here for. There's, you know, there's work in life, but overall, it's the game. And, and anything that can help us find purpose in what we're doing and meaning um, is, is really going to add value for the whole supply chain. So when it comes to technology, it's, it's really about you know, simplicity, purpose, and then finding a way that can make sense of the world around us and make things, make things work, make people happy. That's really what we're trying to do with mission-focused management in our business, but that's in general, I think, what the world needs is uh, those kinds of solutions. I couldn't agree more. And I think we're really lucky to have a group of technologists who are hearing that doing impactful and important work is part of what working in agriculture is, whether that be actually in the field or in the factory, you're still bringing that capability and that ability to feed the world. So thanks for joining us today. This has been a really great conversation. And I think you've inspired a lot of us to, to be an egg. Yeah, thanks for having me, it was fun. This brings us to the end of the episode and the conclusion for this season of All in the Field, AWS and Agriculture. But you can always check out our previous episodes on YouTube and Twitch. And using hashtag All in the Field, you can keep up with John and I on LinkedIn. Watch for announcements for the next season of All in the Field coming later next year. We have a lot of great content left to go at reInvent. And we have some great agricultural customers who will be sharing their stories. Stay tuned for season three of All in the Field next year. And on behalf of all of us here at AWS, thanks for your interest in feeding the future.